No one can hear me. My name is Ogo Kahlo, and I'd like to welcome you to the Ontario Federation of Labor's Pride Goes On Solidarity in Time of a Pandemic. My name is Ogo Ikalo and my pronouns are she, her. I am the Director of Women's and Human Rights at the Ontario Federation of Labor and I welcome you. Um, I want you to note that this webinar will be, um, is being recorded and will be shared uh, for public dissemination on OFL's social media platforms. And so if at any point you feel uncomfortable uh, please, we ask you to turn off your video so you won't be captured in any of um, the images that will be taken by the OFL communications team. Um, however, I will also let you know that the breakout rooms will not be recorded and that is a safe and free space, as is the space as well. But again, if you feel uncomfortable, just uh, feel free to turn off your video at that portion. So at this time, I would like to invite Patty Coates, the president of the Ontario Federation of Labor, to lead our land acknowledgement. Patty? Thank you, Ogo. Um, my uh, welcome, everyone. And my pronouns are uh, she and her. And today, um, in our land acknowledgement, um, I'd like to say that we are coming together this evening for this webinar organized by the Ontario Federation of Labor Solidarity and Pride Committee from our homes in places all across Ontario. I'm attending from Innisfil, Ontario, in the community of Alcona, which is the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people. The Anishinaabe include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Council of the Three Fires. This land was and still is called Turtle Island, inhabited for a millennium by thriving traditional territories bands, and confederacies of Indigenous peoples. Land acknowledgements not only inform us, but challenge each and every one of us to learn and understand Indigenous history, to honour Indigenous diversity and heritage, and call on us to take action. So with that call to take action, I personally pledge and commit to speak and stand against injustice and racism today and every day. I personally pledge and fully commit to providing safe spaces for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples to speak their truth and lived experiences where I will use my ears to carefully listen, hear, and learn. And I personally pledge and wholeheartedly commit to working with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit members to identify <laughs> barriers within the OFL at all levels in our policies and practices that stifle full engagement and participation of First Nations, Métis and Inuit members. And as a labor leader, I acknowledge that indigenous peoples across Turtle Island have been affected negatively by colonialism and will ensure that the OFL advocate for justice, clean water and rights for all First Nation, Métis and Inuit people. Um, Ogo, I think I'm back over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Patty. Can everyone hear me? Patty, can you hear me? Did we I can, yes. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen once again. Amazing. So before I go into some housekeeping uh, duties uh, and uh, points this evening, I would like to inform you that the Ontario Federation of Labor is committed to providing a positive space um, get you here. Everyone see that? Our OFL equity statement? Awesome. Um, the OFL is committed to providing a positive environment at all Federation activities and ensuring that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity. Union solidarity is based on the belief that all peoples are equal and deserve respect words, actions, or conduct which are racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic divide us. Discrimination based on disability, age, religion, language, and ethnic origin also divides us. Harassment is unwelcomed and is an unwelcome action by any, any person, whether verbal, psychological, or physical, on a single or repeated basis, which humiliates, insults, or degrades. The OFL, the OFL considers harassment, bullying, 
or discrimination of any kind of serious offense, all will be investigated. A substantial complaint could result in the removal of the harasser from the event. A letter outlining the reasons for the removal will also be sent to the appropriate affiliate. Now to read the OFL's equity statement in full, you're welcome to visit OFL.ca. Now a few housekeeping details before we commence the formal portion of our evening. We're pleased to provide closed captioning for this event. In order to access that tool after launching the Zoom meeting, click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of the window. Then click show subtitle to display the closed captioning. Then click subtitle settings. So now you can change the font size on the closed captioning and the chat text. We also encourage you to post, share, and tweet on social media, um, on any social media channel of your choice using hashtags power of many, hashtag pie goes on, or hashtag on labor, or on lab. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat room by adding three question marks before your question. And if you have any technical issues, our team will be glad to assist you. Simply add three asterisks before your question in the chat rooms. So we're pleased to offer four breakout room options tonight, including a gay blood band, uh, which is facilitated by uh, CLC's Heather Eklund and Amma Gaye from the OFL. Uh, room number two is aging as 2SLGBTQI+. It's facilitated by Tisha Albino and myself. Transitioning at work will be facilitated in room three by Susan Gatka and Mason Falk and Gay Straight Alliances facilitated in room four by Tanya Luke and Josh Kuse. All right. Now, to be placed in a room of your choice, uh, please add a one, two, or three, or four in front of your name. So for example, Patty Coates is interested, say, in the gay blood band issue. That's in room one. So she would change her name to one, Patty Coates. You can change your name by adding, uh, you can change your name now by clicking on the participants icon that's at the bottom of your Zoom window. In the participants list on the right side of your Zoom window, you can hover over your name and click the rename button. Now you can type in a breakout room number of your choice next to the display name you'll like to appear in the meeting and then click OK. So I just gave you a whole lot of information. <laughs> I apologize, but if you need any help, you can just pop into the chat box and we'll be glad to help you. Um, our team is here to assist and just type the question in the chat box and we will follow up with you. So I would now like to again invite OFL Patty, uh, President Patty Coates back for a special award presentation. Patty. Thank you, Ogo. So uh, tonight we're going to present the uh, Ontario Federation of Labor Solidarity and Pride Champion Award. Uh, each year we give out this award uh, to someone in the community across Ontario. We have uh, nominations and the Solidarity and Pride Committee then deliberate and determine who will be this year's or each year's uh, recipient. So this annual award shines a spotlight on and celebrates an individual or groups who have made a significant or ongoing contribution to the advancement of the two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and intersex human rights, equity, and inclusion. They must be a leader in advocating and advancing the equality and quality of life for 2S LGBTQI plus people in workplaces, community, and globally someone who takes a proactive role in raising awareness and championing to us LGBTQI plus issues. They must also be committed to fostering diversity and inclusion, advancing human rights and promoting social justice for the 2S LGBTQI plus uh, community and peoples. They must be passionate about breaking down barriers for our 2S LGBTQI plus people everywhere and has promoted their rights and equality within the labor movement 
community and or legislative reform. Well, each year we receive an incredible nominations. This year, one stood out for the members of the OFL Solidarity and Pride Committee. This person is an ETFO member from Peterborough, a union steward for their school, an equity champion. They are the local's go-to person for advice on issues of equality, equity, and diversity. Two nominators highlighted the critical and sensitive work this year's recipient has done outside of the normal structures in the role as a school board equity consultant. This year's recipient is always willing to engage in difficult conversations with members to challenge their thinking in a non-threatening, thought-provoking way, not only on 2S LGBTQI plus issues, but on racism, equity, and intersectionality. They are at the forefront of promoting pride in schools in the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. They are at the forefront, sorry, they are one of the founders of Pride Prom and ignites confidence and joy in the students. There's so much more that can be said about this amazing person, but I will end it here and get on to the presentation of the award. This year's Ontario Federation of Labor Champion Award winner is Marjolaine Lapont. Now, we normally prefer to present this award in person and usually in the recipient's community during or before their local pride parade. However, as you know, we're in unprecedented times, so we are doing it in an unprecedented way. So this year, we have sent the award to our recipient, Marjolaine, so that it can be unveiled here during this incredible webinar. So Marjolaine, if we can um, bring her, uh, her uh, picture up and uh, watch as she unveils the, uh, the uh, Pride Champion Award. Can we have her on screen in large, hopefully? Can we unmute her? Yep. Oh, yes, we need to unmute her. <laughs> <laughs> so look at that award. Congratulations, Marjolaine. Congratulations, Marjolaine. And hopefully one day I'll get to meet you in person. Your nominators, there were over three pages of accolades for all the work that you have done within your within your union, within your workplace and school board, and within your community. And we thank you for all of the work um, that you do and for championing to us LGBTQI plus peoples, as well as uh, uh, equity and inclusion and equality. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so kindly. I'm, I'm deeply hum humbled and grateful. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Marjolaine, congratulations. And thank you, Patty, for that presentation. You're very so now, welcome. <laughs> so if Monib is ready, we're actually gonna uh, show you a question in the screen for your response. It's our first polling question of the evening. Okay. So the question is, have you or do you know someone in the 2S LGBTQI plus community that has faced increased barriers because of COVID-19? I see responses are coming in already. This is wonderful. We'll give it a few more moments. And my maestro Munib will let me know when we are ready to cut it off in a few more seconds. Not everyone has voted yet, only 68. So I'm just holding out for some uh, last minute folks. Brilliant. Again, the question is, have you or do you know someone in the 2S LGBTQI plus community that has faced increased barriers because of COVID-19?
Brilliant. So the results are in and we have an overwhelming 75% saying yes, they have. So that's some food for thought as I'm going to throw, his, throw things over to our moderators for this evening. I thank everyone for participating in the poll. So I would now like to welcome uh, Chris Peterson, who is the chair of your OFL Solidarity and Pride Committee, and Tanya Liu who is also an OFL Solidarity and Pride Committee member and a union organizing representative with UFCW. Tanya, Chris, take it away. Thank you, Ogo. I'm wondering, oh, so, oh, so you're doing, uh, Maneeb, are you taking control of the, whose uh, video is being shown? Yeah, Maneeb and I will be working behind the scenes on that. Oh, awesome, okay, great. Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to have everyone here uh, with such a distinguished uh, group of panelists. I'm looking forward to having uh, some good discussion with, uh, with everybody. I'll start off with an introduction. Uh, so my name is Chris Peterson. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am currently serving as an OFL Equity VP for the Solidarity and Pride Committee. I have been on the committee for a number of years, uh, done some really great stuff with the OFL, enjoyed working um, um, side by side with Patty Coates uh, through many of those years. And uh, I look forward to the year ahead and I'm glad that this pandemic has not uh, slowed us down. Um, I actually come from OSSTF. I'm a high school teacher. I teach up in Simcoe County. And so I, yeah, I'm a proud member of OSSTF. And I'm also joined by um, a fellow uh, labor activist, Tanya Liu, who is also on the Solidarity and Pride Committee. So before I introduce all the panelists, uh, I'll throw it over to Tanya to introduce herself. Thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome everyone. It's so great to see everybody here. Like Chris said, um, I'm an organizer with the uh, United Food and Commercial Workers and I'm, always, I'm also on the OFL Solidarity and Pride Committee. Uh, over the years, I worked with many of you, I see, uh, participants, panelists. Uh, we've done some great work in the community. So I'm so glad to, uh, today we have this opportunity to be together virtually. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. All right, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. So without further ado, I am going to introduce all of the panelists for this evening. Uh, so we have to start off with Dr. Jill Andrew. So uh, Dr. Jill Andrew is the MPP for Toronto St. Paul's. Jill serves as the Ontario NDP culture critic and women's issues critic for the official opposition. Jill is also a member of the Ontario NDP Black Caucus, a first of its kind in Ontario legislative history. Jill also sits on the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. Jill is also the first Black and queer person to be elected to the Ontario Legislature and reportedly in Canada. She was also a proud member of QP 3903 and OSSTF District 12. Uh, thank you, uh, Jill Andrew, for making yourself available for the discussion this evening. Uh, moving on to Marjolaine Lapointe. Uh, we've already had a great introduction about Marjolaine from um, Patty. Congratulations, Marjolaine, on winning the Pride Champion Award. I will say a few things about you. Um, uh, so Marjolaine Lap Lapointe is an equity and inclusive education consultant for the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board and has been working in the field of Indigenous education since 2002. Her primary focus is language and culture revitalization through contemporary and traditional teaching methods, weaving culture and language across curriculum strands and student engagement. Currently focused on equity in the classroom, Marjolaine's skills and knowledge in the realms of privilege, anti-racism, culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy, and professional development for teachers are an invaluable asset to the education field. Marjolaine is a proud member of that. And moving on, uh, Raven Wings. So Raven Wings is an Afro-Indigenous trans woman and member of the Black Lives Matter Toronto Steering Committee. Raven identifies as African, Bermudian, Two-Spirit, Mohawk, and a queer transcendent empowerment movement storyteller. 
The speech that Raven made recently in front of a monument in Queen's Park has been described as an activism manifesto and has gone viral in both mainstream and social media. Welcome, Raven. And thank you. Having me. Thank you. Terence <clears throat> Carnahan is the NDP member of Provincial Parliament for London North Centre and Tuas LGBTQI plus critic. He is passionate about social justice, healthcare, housing, and education. Before politics, he was an elementary school teacher librarian, workplace steward, and teacher local executive member. As an educator, his work focused on critical literacy, digital citizenship, media literacy, and social justice. Terence is also London, Ontario's first openly gay MPP. Welcome, Terence. And last, certainly not least, we have Miranda Schreiber. Miranda is a writer, researcher, and advocate for 2S LGBTQI plus health equity. Miranda has been working with a team of researchers in U of T's postgraduate medical education department on new LGBTQ plus focused health curriculum for the past year. So welcome, Miranda. And now that we have been introduced to the panelists, I would love to get um, on to some questions. So we spent some time looking at um, being able to tackle many issues and we figured a good way to do it would be to isolate um, specific issues and address them to one panelist but this is just a way to open up conversation so i'd love to start off with jill andrew um, if, if jill's there and i would love to start with the question sure. thanks jill so in this time of social isolation, the 2S LGBTQI plus community has felt the impact of not being able to connect with each other at traditional community hubs. As queer owned businesses continue to suffer with financial hardships, what effects do you imagine this will have on your community? Thank you so much for the question um, and for this invitation. I've been struggling with my internet connection for the last little while, so I'm now using my Samsung and uh, the uh, Zoom isn't quite the same on your phone as it is on your computer. But uh, thank you very much for the question. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, um, our LGBTQ2S plus spaces are so much more than nightclubs or bookstores or cafes or, or what have you. Uh, they are homes away from home. You know, uh, for many people, from young people all the way up to the other end of the life spectrum, you know, if you don't have that acceptance uh, in your quote unquote biological family, you know, we often find that acceptance in our chosen family. And uh, many of those chosen spaces are in the village, at least. Uh, for many of us in Toronto. And uh, that's not to suggest that, you know, uh, we don't have inequities in the village or inequities within our queer, trans, and gender and non conforming communities. That wouldn't be true whatsoever. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, with COVID 19 and with many businesses shuttered or closed down because of the pandemic, uh, people just haven't been able to organize or, or connect and socialize. Um, the way they have. And I have to say that this could have been remedied at the very earliest part of this pandemic. Um, if the Ford government, and I'm saying it very frankly, if the Ford government had listened um, to small business owners, um, to community members, to the official opposition, us, myself, and Terrence, and, and the other 38 of us uh, who were demanding, you know, pleading with the government to directly fund small businesses, you know, so they could survive uh, past COVID-19. Um, the majority of our businesses are in a very bad place. Uh, even with reopening, uh, many have told us that they may not last more than a few months um, of reopening. So, you know, what does it mean for our community? When we have spaces where we can feel safer, uh, where we can feel loved, uh, where we can feel like we matter, uh, that is critical to our physical health, um, our mental health. You know, it, it, it's critical to our sense of self. 
which then makes us even stronger to go into the world as students, as employees, as entrepreneurs, as renters, as homeowners, as parents, you know, as, as, as caregivers, as educators, uh, whatever may have you, right? So it's really important that the government, uh, you know, gave direct support and they did not, they did not give direct support. Um, the NDP, we had a plan that we had proposed very, very early on called Save Main Street. And this would have allowed our small business owners to get 75% subsidy, um, up to $10,000 for a few months on their rent. Uh, that could have made a critical, uh, that could have given critical assistance at a time where stores uh, were hanging uh, by a thread. And the government chose to deny that option. So what we saw were so many of our you know, of our mainstays, I think of Club 120, you know, uh, for goodness sakes, um, an iconic space, you know, where greats like DJ Black Cat played and, and did these great parties. I have had the pleasure of attending way too many of them, you know, and again, it's all about community. It's all about a place where we can belong, where we can be seen and heard, you know, where we feel safer, uh, where we feel included. And, and I cannot stress how important that is, um, not just for all queer folks, but especially POC, you know, especially Black folks, you know, especially Two-Spirit folks, especially uh, disabled and, and racialized, you know, folks who are already at the periphery of even the queer community to begin with, you know? So it's a huge loss uh, that the government didn't step up early and support our small businesses directly because they're so much more than brick and mortar. Uh, they are our heart. They're our communities. And, and as I said earlier, they are homes away from home for many people, especially our youth, especially our seniors who are often socially isolated. Um, it's a travesty that the government didn't step up and help Ontarians out. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, you make some really great points there, uh, pointing at what the government could have done, should have done, uh, to ensure that our communities continue to thrive and that small businesses uh, don't go under. I'm wondering if any other panelists have anything to offer uh, around what you think could be done in order to support these businesses, maybe with not even getting the support uh, from the local government. Feel free to just un uh, unmute your mic if there's anything you'd like to add to the conversation. Terrence? You know, Chris, uh, you know, I'm just reflecting on what Jill had to say. She's absolutely right. The businesses that have been let down throughout this pandemic by this government have been our small businesses. We take a look at uh, the SUS or CEWS, the, the wage subsidy that has been offered to mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of businesses, but it mainly applies to large businesses. They've been able to cover 75% of their wages, <clears throat> which is something that small businesses have not been able to make use of. It's a federal program uh, that was offered but we see nothing that has been offered for small businesses that don't qualify for that level of support. They're struggling and they represent so much of our economy and it is a disgrace that uh, such a pro-business government as they claim has let down our folks so deeply. Mm -hmm. Right on. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Terrence. Anybody else? I see some agreement from the panelists. Mm -hmm. Oops. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you uh, so much for those uh, remarks, Jill and Terrence. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tanya uh, to ask the next question. Thanks, Chris. And Jill and Terrence, thank you for always uh, speaking up and standing up for the community at Queen's Park. Um, you know, as the OFL and the labor movement, we are here supporting you. Uh, so my next Thanks. My next question is for Marshall Ann. Uh, again, Marshall Ann, congratulations on winning the uh, Pride Champion Award. That was well <laughs> deserved. Yes. So my question for you is, you know, big strides continue to be made for issues of inclusion for 
towards LGBTQI plus youth in our school system. Can you shed some light on how the intersections of your identity impact your practice and your ideas about what should be learned? I, absolutely, I can. And thank you so much for the question. And, and thank you so much to the OFL for, uh, for this, the great honor of the award and for having the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I agree that big strides have been made. However, we have, we have a lot of work to do still within the public school system uh, moving forward in the area of inclusion and equity for two-spirit LGBTQ people. Um, in Indigenous cultures, prior to colonization, um, 2S LGBTQ folks would have been revered, and they are con continue to be revered in many spaces in our, our cultures. Um, 2S LGBTQ folks have um, have the ability to see far broader than the binaries that Western culture teaches us to have. And so from, from my perspective as an Indigenous person, um, and I should locate myself first, um, I'm Deer Clan from Art Algonquin First Nation. Um, we are a landless First Nation in the Kichizibia, the, um, the uh, Ottawa River watershed. So, um, my, from my perspective, one of the, the most important things that we must do um, would be to, to decolonize our understandings of gender, to decolonize our understandings of sexuality, to decolonize um, the way that we approach even just visions of humanity, where I think in a lot of, in a lot of spaces, uh, we tend to silo our identities, right? And so when I walk into the office, I am, I am the equity consultant, or I am, you know, I am this person, I am that person. Sometimes I'm, you know, I am Ziguan's mom, or I'm Benajayas' mom. But we do, um, we tend to silo our identities. And through processes of decolonization and really picking apart what, um, what those processes of totalization and capitalism and and everything that we're living in right now under under um, a Western mindset has really done it tends it it helps us to silo our identities and then we can't see the beauty that is intersectionality. You know, I hear a lot of folks talking about intersectionality as compounded oppression, and it is absolutely. But there is also uh, compounded beauty, compounded empathy, compounded understanding, um, and compounded relationship. And so when we really start to pick apart what binary thinking does to us, um, that's when we start to be able to see, uh, to start to see that, that humanity in others and, and build a relationship in, uh, in a more equitable manner. You Thank you, Marjolaine. Um, I can actually relate to that, to what you said. Like we, I totally feel we style our identity all the time. Um, any, uh, any other panelists that wanted to speak to this uh, question as well? If, okay, if not, thank you, Marjolaine. We'll go back to Chris for the next question. Thanks, Tanya, and uh, thank you, Marjolaine. I think you pointed to something really um, poignant there with the connection between um, colonization and the idea of binaries and how those are inextricably linked and removing, decolonizing gives us the opportunity to see things beyond the binary. So I think that's a really important point and I thank you for that. Uh, moving on to uh, Raven, Raven Wings. So this question is for you. In this time of social isolation, many have questioned how pride functions in our communities. Pride can be viewed as political. It can be seen as a form of activism and also a celebration all at the same time. 
What do you imagine to be effective activism? And is there any specific way that activism should look? Thank you for the question. Um, that's a big one. Um, I, th I think that in order to affect change, in order to affect um, or to create or to imagine new ways of being in relationship to each other, um, we must first start with ourselves. So if I'm asking you to provide space for me and all of my identities, then I also must figure out the way for me to allow all of your identities to, to show up and be in space. I think that um, there is a sort of colonial practice of one person making a, a decision over how other people should act. And so for me, it's not my job to tell people how to um, be better activists. I think it, I, the way that I do that is by showing it in myself. Um, the way that I do that is, is by offering an alternative to what somebody else might be thinking about. What I do is I make sure that, you know, all the spaces that I'm in involve many different perspectives, many different identities and lived experiences. I think that Pride as an organization has failed in many, many ways um, to be inclusive, even in their festival. And so their larger mission um, kind of falls by the wayside when, when there are people who have been asking, um, begging, pleading, um, <laughs> protesting, shutting down parades, um, to get acknowledgement, to get inclusiveness in a pride that is supposed to present and represent all of us. Um, it doesn't, it largely functions as a business. And so when you are, when there is this conversation of property over people, business over profit over um, our humanities, then you run into problems. And so when we decolonize, we also have to break down the systems of capitalism. Um, and so in breaking down those systems, that means that even the ones that I'm comfortable with, but I, but I'm like my Fenty and all the things that I enjoy will also have to go um, so that there is more space for everyone to have what they deserve. Because I feel like once you ask people, what they need, they can tell you. Uh, I feel like as a trans person, there are always people in rooms making decisions for me and my, my communities or communities that I'm a part of um, without a trans person ever being in the room, ever being in the conversation, ever having our, our actual experiences and humanity considered. Um, and so I think Pride's representation has, has, has they, I think they've attempted in some ways and then in other ways have like shirked responsibility over to other organizations and volunteers who make pride happen. Very, um, very interesting uh, point of view there, Raven. I'm hearing a lot um, from what I gather from what you're saying, a lot about keeping a conversation going. So whether that be seen as a negotiation, a conversation, activism, where we're working together to share, um, share our points of view and what our needs are, um, as opposed to something like you mentioned capitalism, where the priority is money, right? And with that priority comes a shutdown of, of the conversation. So you bring some uh, really great points to the table there. Can I uh, ask any of the other panelists to, to jump in on that about uh, effective activism, what that could look like in our communities? You can also take a look in the chat here. Oh, Jill? I think you're still muted, Jill. Hang tight, Kate. We're going to try and unmute you. There we are. Oh, there Thank we are. <laughs> I think it's working now. Um, I just wanted to add 
a couple of words in terms of um, activism and our 2SLGBTQ community. I, I think it's so important that when we are calling upon community members to advise, to recommend, uh, to advocate, to do this labor, emotional labor, uh, it cannot be free. And, and that is part of decolonizing capitalism, you know? Um, I cannot count the number of times that racialized Black, Indigenous, uh, you know, two SLGBTQ plus disabled, you name it, marginalized groups are often asked to share the expertise of their lived experience uh, without compensation. Mm -hmm. and, and that is part of capitalism as well. So I think we have to we have to break down those barriers because that also leads to economic independence and freedom and autonomy uh, for the very racialized and marginalized groups that uh, main stream groups uh, speak of wanting to help liberate. <laughs> you can't liberate folks if you're not paying them for their services, you know, or if you're tapping them uh, for information when it works for your agenda you know, or, or, or for your political career even. Uh, you have to be engaging folks where they're at uh, all year, and you have to recognize that their expertise is valuable and, and is worth being compensated and remunerated however that is possible. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Jill. Absolutely. Great, any other points from the panel? Sorry, can I just add one more thing? Um, um, what I also should have said is being here in, in Takaranto, Toronto, um, it's also important that we are looking to the understandings and the teachings of those who came before colonization, um, the folks who learned how to uh, move and create and grow and share um, in ways that helped this land survive, people survive, um, and, and for us as, as allies to that, to Indigenous people um, on land where we're trying to liberate ourselves or find equality or equity, um, is, it's also important to locate, like, who you are within a movement. So myself as an Afro-Indigenous person, but I don't live an, an Indigenous experience, um, have to recognize what that means when I'm showing up to support. Um, that's the same way as say a white gay, gay male showing up to support me as a Black trans woman. Um, they're different experiences. And so um, anyone who believes that it is their sort of position to liberate another person should be thinking about what allows them to feel like that's a possibility. Um, <laughs> because uh, liberation isn't for you to give. It's, 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 it's not, it doesn't belong to any one person or it shouldn't. Um, so that's sort of a little add on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your voice, Raven. Uh, I saw Josh. Yeah. Um, I would like to add on that. Uh, I think most of all, uh, I think we need to, re to respect each other. Uh, to be ex inclusive is to respect each other and understand each other and also uh, be a listener, you know. You need to listen just for you to absorb what's going on with us together and have a common goal that we can understand each other and that, that respect will exist between all of us. And that's how we're going to go uh, to be inclusive, that we are, we, ha we, we, we cut that barrier that we are, we are one, you know, in, in, this, in this world, in this, in this, you know, that's how we're going to give in ourselves that passion that we care to each other, you know, and take out that hate. The hate is is the main thing because it's only uh, it's only on your mind to put in on that. Take it out because it will not help for everything that we need to do. We need to believe in yourself that you can do something more than that to make everything better in this world. 
in your community, in your friends, whoever you're with, be, be yourself that you give in, that you want the kindness, the kind of kindness that you want to, to, uh, to give to the person that you can, you are there on your side, you know, whatever it is, you need to feel to that person that you're, you're beside her, whatever happens, you're listening. And in that case, you will know what's happening to this person and that it comes to help to each other. Thank you for that, Josh. Uh, I'm going to turn it to Tanya. Tanya, you had mentioned there was uh, some questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to. Sure. Uh, yes, there is a question in the chat from Graham. Uh, Graham asks, while it's important to advocate better support for the queer businesses that are deeply, cher cher uh, deeply cherished in the community, there are also often sites of a of oppression for employees, performers, and customers. What can workers and allies do to make sure employers are addressing long-standing issues like anti-Black racism as they reopen, rather than trying to go back to, quote, business as usual? Um, any panelists wanted to answer this question? Sure, I can start. I, I think, I think, I'm grateful for the question. I think that's, that, that is something that a lot of folks are asking themselves in this particular time period. Um, however, I think the, what is important to, to put more focus on is less of, of the Black experience and more of um, addressing the systems of, of whiteness that, um, and white supremacy that make it difficult in the first place. So you can't, um, so you can't sort of um, fix a problem that you're not going to the root to uproot. Um, and so if it is in the foundation of how it is built, then it is a foundation that you have to look at. It is the leadership that you have to look at. It is the board that you have to look at. It is um, every single person um, is, um, participates in anti-black racism um, by participating in a kind of capitalism because we have to survive right and so if we can be self-reflective if we can be have a commitment to um, rap to like a radical commitment to conflict I think that we can figure those things out. I think that sometimes when conflict arises, we feel like we have to run away or we sit down and we be quiet. But I think those are where we find um, the gems and the jewels, the things that allow us to, to connect to each other and also um, shift and change and grow together. So you, you get together with the folks who you're, who you're discussing, the black and brown and people of color, the queer and trans folks, and you, and you all, you ask them like, what would make you feel safe? What would make you feel um, more validated and, and allow them to direct that as well? Thank you, Raven. That's certainly a commitment that we should all make and all work on. Um, do we, is there any other Panelists that want to jump in before we go to the next question. Uh, Josh, did you raise your hand? No? All right. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, Josh, yes. I mute you. Go ahead, Josh. Oh, uh, so in part of the, for in part for the employers to do something in times like this, we want to be sure that, that the, we want to be sure that the employers protect our jobs, protect the workers' jobs, and we want to ensure that the safety of uh, route back, back to work will be there. And we want to be sure that the late of workers will be protected and uh, uh, late of workers will be protected for, to, uh, for safe return to work. Thank you, Josh. Um, I think Jill raised her hand. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I, I just wanted to say two bits as well, too. You know, I think it's it's so crucial that employers adhere, you know, to our Ontario Human Rights Code, 
<laughs> you know? And I also think it is crucial that we continue to put pressure um, on the Ford government to have an anti-racism directorate that actually works, uh, one that is intersectional, uh, one that recognizes that addressing anti-racism work uh, you know, means also addressing anti-homophobia and anti-transphobia or and transphobia and homophobia and all the other uh, isms and phobias that attach themselves uh, to racial inequ inequity and frankly white supremacy. You know, I, I think I can't stress that enough. It's really important that we uh, keep the pressure on because currently, you know, uh, the Ford government's bills, their motions, uh, do not have an intersectional lens. Um, they do not tackle uh, the nuanced issues, you know, of racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism. Uh, they certainly do not address uh, two SLGBTQ community issues or needs. We saw that last year when the government tried to erase our lives, literally, uh, from school curriculum. And we continue to see that. We continue to see that, you know, where the government hasn't said anything or, or hasn't committed, you know, to, to, to collecting any kind of data based, you know, on LGBTQ experiences, um, on, on the inequities to access to health care, for instance, or all of the other social conditions, you know, like housing, for instance, which we know there's plenty of discrimination, especially uh, within trans community uh, when it comes to accessing homes, accessing housing, you know, uh, not being discriminated against at the bank, accessing loans for small businesses, you know, like our, our entire governmental structure needs to change. And they need to recognize that equity isn't a handout. Um, it's not something to be included or something to be invited. Uh, it just needs to be centered. Like that needs to be where the conversation starts from a place of equity and inclusion and from a place of recognizing that the system is broken and it hasn't worked for a long time. Uh, it works for those that it keeps in place and those that want to maintain the status quo. Uh, but for many others, it just does not work. So we need to move away from the idea of um, accommodating, you know, or uh, accepting difference to starting from a centered place where we're exploring a difference and we're exploring how the rest of the world, you know, can accommodate for once, <laughs> as opposed to us having to accommodate to the rest of the world. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Jill. I see in the chat everyone agrees with what you said. Oh, okay. I'm not must must be I can't see the chat on my phone. But okay. <laughs> equity must be centered. Equity is not a handout. Um, before we go to, thank you, everyone. Uh, before we go to Terence, uh, Ogo, did you want to uh, talk about the break, uh, breakout room again so people can get ready? Absolutely. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, what an insightful conversation. This is great. Uh, we just wanted to remind people that there are breakout rooms. In fact, we have four this evening. Um, room one is the Gay Blood Band. Room two is Asian as a 2S LGBTQI+. Uh, room three is Transitioning at Work. And room number four is Gay Straight Alliances. For those who joined us a little later, I'm just going to run through quickly one more time on how to identify which room you prefer. So to be placed into your preferred room, uh, we ask that you please now add uh, the numbers one, two, three, or four in front of your name. So again, for example, Patty Coates is interested in room two, for in uh, instance, which is, which is aging as a 2S LGBTQI+. She's going to change her name to one Patty Coates. So, in order to change your name, uh, you can do that by clicking on the participants icon that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In the participants list, on the right side of your Zoom window, you can hover over your name and click the rename button. At that point, you can uh, type the breakout room of your choice, so one, two, three, or four, um, next to the name that you would like to see displayed. Um, 
in your appearance at the meeting. So again, room one is a gay blood band, room two is aging as a 2S LGBTQI+, room three is transitioning at work, and room four is great uh, gay straight alliances. Again, if you need any help whatsoever, uh, feel free to just drop your question in the chat box and any of uh, the ORFL team uh, will be glad to assist you. So I'm going to throw it back to Chris, who's done an amazing job. Thank you, Chris and Tanya. Thanks, Sogo. Uh, so Tanya, you were going to ask the question for Terrence. Yes. All right. So the next question is for Terrence. Um, so, you know, during this pandemic, numerous systemic barriers have been spotlighted for many equity seeking groups. Where do we even begin with issues of systemic racism within the 2S LGBTQI plus community and beyond? Thank you very much for the question, Tanya, and you're absolutely right. COVID-19 has shown the systemic barriers that equity deserving groups face. It has laid bare so much of the systemic inequality that we have within our society. Early on, people said that COVID was gonna be the great equalizer, but we know the absolute opposite is true. <clears throat> COVID-19 has adversely impacted racialized Ontarians, seniors, and those living in poverty. Yeah. We look at the material impact, such as job losses, uh, the queer community and, and folks who were precariously employed were dramatically impacted. Uh, they were also already facing in some income security and they were already facing precarious housing. This has made that crisis so much worse. The median income for trans Canadians is, hovers around $15,000 per year. That's well below the poverty line. And as Jill has mentioned, COVID has shown the importance of safe housing. Mm -hmm. If we take a look at queer youth, they make up to 25, between 25 and 40% of our homeless youth in Canada. And that is an absolute tragedy. How can someone become their best self if they don't have a place to call home or a place to be safe? We also, Take a look at folks who are meant to quarantine as a result of COVID-19. And how can you do that if you don't have a safe place to call home? COVID-19 has also created this bizarre overlap of public and private spaces. For those who are able to work from home, uh, we have to now invite our work friends into our home, someplace which should be safe for us uh, as LGBTQ folks. Or perhaps folks aren't out at home and are for other safety reasons. And it's important to respect that. I must commend the OFL for beginning this discussion and saying, if you're not comfortable, turn off your video. And that's something that is in incredibly powerful and really important. You know, Jill, myself, and the Ontario NDP have been fighting so hard with the Ford government to make housing concerns for their primary concern. This is fundamental to our human existence. But also, we've talked about providing rent subsidies. We have our Save Main Street plan, which was to help small businesses, but we've also called upon the government to provide rent subsidies for regular folks. Up to 80% of their income place an absolute moratorium on evictions during COVID-19, and as well, help cover the costs of utilities. Because if people aren't able to work, how are they going to cover the rent? We saw Doug Ford get up and, and waggle his finger and, you know, ask landlords to do the right thing and ask renters to do the right thing. But then he sent a contrary message by saying, if you have to eat, eat. And if you have to, you know, if you have to wait to pay your rent, nobody will be evicted. But then he backtracked on his own words, passing Bill 184 and making it easier for landlords to evict their tenants. That is a human rights crisis and I am so frightened of what the month of August holds for so many in our community. You know, Joe also spoke about the years-long underfunding of the anti-racism directorate. <laughs> right now we see funding that is a paltry sum, you know, a few million dollars to combat racism across the entire province of Ontario. We need to see a solid commitment. In the beginning of this government, they started off with a throne speech to announce their plans, their mandate, and sort of set the tone for, <laughs> for their time in office. And I found myself scowling at the Lieutenant Governor as she read these words, even though those aren't her words, she was reading them from the government. 
she started off that speech written by the progressive conservatives and it started off without a land acknowledgement. We know better. We know the TRC calls to action. And further, when they were discussing the pillars of diversity, such as race, race ethnicity, et cetera, they threw in the word lifestyle. Well, any queer individual can tell you that is dog whistle politics and indicating that being gay is a choice. And it was absolute terror went through me. And we saw the repeal of the health and phys ed curriculum, uh, the scrubbing of LGBTQ voices, and the target that was placed upon the backs of LGBTQ students as a result of this government's regressive policies. But we also have to look towards not just LGBTQ perspectives, but also perspectives of, of racism. We've seen over the last few months how incredibly difficult it is, and I, I must come back to Marjolaine's words, they were absolutely apt that uh, intersectional identities result in compound inequity. We have to make sure that pride organizations are listening. It's almost, we have a long history um, with, you know, whether it is the POC community or the queer community. When we take a look at Marsha P. Johnson, who threw the first brick at Stonewall, we owe her so much as a black trans activist. It's like we need to renew our vows uh, as, you know, between the queer community and, and uh, between Black Lives Matter and other organizations. There has to be a conversation, there has to be listening, and there has to be action. It's not just about cisgendered white gay men. <clears throat> But we also have to make sure that we as a queer community stand with racialized Canadians and make sure we are helping them take center stage, making sure that they are receiving the importance that it is, is deserved. You know, we talked earlier about, uh, about speakers at different events and how uh, they're often invited. And I have to ask the question, you know, is, are they being invited so that the organizer can engage in some sort of self-congratulatory behavior? Because it's absolutely right. They need to be paid for their time. We also have to ask the question, or an organizer should really ask the question, are, is, is someone being asked to participate for the organization's benefit or for that individual's benefit? Really, what is, it, what is the question here? So, as you know, I'm so proud to stand with Jill, and I'm so proud to be your Ontario NDP LGBTQ issues critic. Please know that we are here to elevate your voices. We're here to take your concerns forward to Queen's Park. Um, I can't even tell you the amount of disgusting behavior that Jill has had to experience within that chamber, within a place that should be folks at their best behavior. The amount of tone policing, the amount of negativity she receives, she is an absolute champion and I'm so honored to stand alongside her. But I'm so proud to be here and so thankful to the OFL for organizing this event. Thank you, Terrence. That's, uh, those are some really good points that we can all work on. Um, uh, would any other panelists want to jump in? And uh, also I have a follow-up question for Terence and Jill is what we can do as the OFL and the activists, the labor movement to support your work in the community. Yes, Jill. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Terence uh, who stands in that house firmly and has seen and witnessed and documented and you know it's just a real joy to work with Terence and and to work with many of the members of our caucus but it is an uphill battle and uh you know with that i want to say thank you to all of the young people you know one of the best things i've seen is young people coming to queen's park uh, they're not there now with COVID-19, but coming to Queen's Park, making themselves seen and heard uh, in the members gallery, uh, even though we're not supposed to uh, make noise in the members gallery or you will be escorted out. 
uh, but also just connecting with their local MPPs or coming to talk to myself and Terrence or coming to talk to Black Caucus. Uh, we are all really invested in bringing young people, uh, bringing you know, members of our queer, trans, and non-binary communities and two-spirit communities to the legislature so they can see themselves reflected in that house. Uh, it is nowhere near reflective of our diverse community, but it is up to us who are elected there to bring people in so that one day they can sit next to us. When we're gone, they can have our seat or maybe they'll even take a seat, who knows? <laughs> But the reality is we just need to have representation. We need to have representation because not only does it matter, which is a cliche, you know, representation matters. Yes, it absolutely matters, but it's with having the right representation with the lived experience and with the conviction to make change happen. That's how it gets done. You can't learn this in a textbook. It's not some theory that you can put fancy words on it. This is lived experience with passion and conviction to make change for the better for Ontarians. And that's why our folks need to be at the table. We have to be at the table. And you know, Terrence is right. You know, I'm not a very uh, polished person. So when I get up to speak, I speak. And I speak based on my experience as an educator, as an education worker, you know, as someone who's come up from a working class family, as a black woman, as a queer woman, you know, as a fat woman, for goodness sakes, I bring everything to the table and the government doesn't know how to manage that. They don't know how to listen and, and to be told about themselves. And that's what we need to do. We need to ensure that we're consistently telling the government about themselves in organized ways so we can es essentially dismantle and rebuild the system that we need to see. And that means a system that, you know, doesn't cost people their lives. It means a system that educates our kids uh, without demolishing their self-esteem. And, and it means access to healthcare and act to access to housing, you know, and access to employment for goodness sakes. You know, for those who are immigrants, it means, you know, the, the ability to live without fear of having to look over your shoulder every moment. So I, I cannot emphasize enough how nuanced and how intersectional this all is. And, you know, if we have a government who only cares about one slice of the pie, that is not enough. It's all or nothing. It is all or nothing. Thank you. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Jill. Um, like Raven just said in the chat, it's not an intellectual idea, it's a lived idea. All right, thank you, Terence and Jill. Uh, we have another polling question. Muneeb, can we have the uh, polling question up? All right, so the question is, do you feel you have enough information in your workplace to support coworkers that identify as 2S LGBTQI+. All right, we'll give a couple minutes to a couple seconds <laughs> to vote. Right. Okay, it's five more seconds. Oh, done. <laughs> it's okay. So 84% of you said no, you do not feel like you have enough information to support your coworkers. I, we, we have work to do. Okay, I will give it back to Chris. Thank you, Tanya. And uh, thank you, Terrence and Jill for your voices at Queen's Park. Um, we definitely need them there. Uh, Miranda, this question is for you. So the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light a number of questions around how we face challenging health concerns. How do we tackle systemic barriers to health that impact the 2S LGBTQI plus community? Um, yeah, so I guess kind of just to echo what so many of the other panelists have said, um, well, we, we just don't have enough. First of all, we should have more data than we do. And the Ford government considered collecting uh, 2S LGBTQI plus specific uh, COVID data, and then they just didn't. And it's really easy to do that. Um, and I know they considered it because I sent like a billion emails, but they just decided not to for whatever reason. Um, but all the data that we do have 
demonstrate again and again that uh, to us LGBTQI um, people live shorter and healthier lives than our cisgender straight counterparts. Um, and we're more likely to be immunocompromised and less likely to go to the doctor. Um, and so something that I have been trying really hard to incorporate into our uh, sort of curriculum development is to explain to stu uh, like students at this, just that although they've been taught this sort of like scientific perspective from which they have to like extract, um, you know, a physical body from a, a personal history and sort of weed out any intrusion of like history or like ideology or um, personal experiences because uh, queer, two-spirit and trans people are at a disadvantage because of our subjectivity, because although we all have access to um, or, you know, unless we're undocumented, we have access to a public health system. We don't interpret or experience that system in the same way. Um, I'm pretty, like, most, almost, I feel like all of us have had a terrible experience at the doctors. Um, and I was a patient for 10 years and I have like so many stories. Um, but what I think is really important to inform practicing physicians and those who are working towards getting their degrees is that with the intrusion of um, like capitalism and colonialism here, um, you know, two-spirited LGBT, LGBT people were like the administering health, like they were healers in their communities. And now suddenly um, everyone in our community is, represents like one of the most underserved health demographics in Canada. So clearly something's happened um, and something's intervened. So um, it's really looking to the systemic roots of how um, capitalism has now informed our understanding of, of our individual identities and created these material conditions in which our community doesn't flourish. Um, and in terms of remedying that, like I am, we're working on adding stuff into the curriculum, which is really important. But as much as like educating individual doctors and nurses and other healthcare practitioners will help, um, the LGBTQ2SI health gap is created by like a plurality of causes. And ultimately it comes from systemic injustice. And even if we educate doctors, and nurses, we're still gonna, those conditions will still be reproduced because our system is so unjust. So ultimately, I think the way to solve the health gap would be reforming how we train doctors, but also we need like free pharma care and dental, actual repar uh, actual, sorry, um, reparations for indigenous people, legal aid for refugees, a path to citizenship for undocumented people, um, social housing, free therapy. We sort of have sex ed now for like a year um, and that's sort of like the route to not just taking a set, a, a few demographics and explaining that they're at risk for these given conditions, but explaining why they're at risk and what violent institutions are putting them in that position. Thank you uh, so much, Miranda. I'm, I'm just reading through the comments here and there's a lot of agreement about uh, the discrimination that exists for um, the 2S LGBTQI plus community uh, in healthcare. And some of what you were saying there actually uh, resonates with, I think, what Raven was mentioning about sometimes if the issues exist in the foundation, it's the foundation that we need to chip away at. And um, I know that some of the work that you've been doing involves sensitive, sensitivity training for medical professionals. Um, what sort of uh, what sort of work are you doing around that, and um, how do you think it will impact uh, the practitioners that come out of that training? Yeah. So um, as I said, I guess we really I wish we could, but we can't just educate it into nothingness, which was sort of my hope when I first started. Um, but although some of the sources like 
not knowing um, not just about LGBTQ 2SI um, specific health needs, but even just how to inter interact. Like, I don't know, my family doctor once just said to me, like, do you have a pal? And I didn't even know what she meant. Like, and she meant, do you have a girlfriend? But like, she was just like, I thought she was asking if I had friends, like I didn't, anyway, so it, it's not just sort of like adding these given biological, um, like different, like this is how you act with this demographic in this situation. We really kind of need to undergo an audit of exactly how um, medical education and education for all healthcare practitioners functions. Um, so I guess we wanted, we need more Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ2SI doctors and nurses. Um, and often what I find, and it's especially frustrating as a, a sort of even a current patient, but is that a lot of the initiatives orient themselves around how like queer medical students experience medical school, which is really important. But ultimately, we should be thinking about the patient's needs and centering the patients and thinking about how every moment of somebody's interaction with the medical institution is it, it's like the confluence of all of these different variables and each one of those variables needs to be audit, like considered and um, sort of pre-existing homophobia, uh, transphobia, racism, colonialism, all that needs to be, it, it all needs to be like examined and identified. Um, yeah, so I hope that we can do it. And we, we're actually including um, COVID education into the curriculum, like we're telling people about how to, um, like that we're A, disproportionately at risk for getting COVID because so many of people in our community are immunocompromised. And then secondly, that we're disproportionately at risk of being harmed by social distancing. So if you're not out to your family or you rely on community resources, um, as other panelists have been talking about, um, even in our research from like reaching out to different NGOs to interview them, um, they've like barely, especially hotlines, like they're so overloaded with calls that they can't even really, like they don't have the time to even talk to us. Like it's, it's it, the definitely all of this is manifesting um, so that's an important thing too, is to, to work on documenting it. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Miranda, for bringing up some really great points.